Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. And welcome to the latest panel of the second day of Supercharged, our three-day revenue excellence summit. Today's event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. You've probably heard of us by now, but for those of you not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest and highest quality community for sales management and sales leadership and sales revenue and operations and sales enablement. Our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer the toughest questions out there. No need to reinvent the wheel yourself. Our community is here to help you on your sales journey. If you're not a member yet, um, you'll be invited to join after the end of the summit, and I hope you will. This summit would not be possible without our amazing partners who you see on this slide here. A big thank you to them for making this happen. These partners are not only sponsoring this specific event, but all three days of our Supercharged Summit. To learn more about our partners, click on the Sponsor Booths tab at the top of the events page and check out all of the ungated valuable resources that our sponsors have made available for us, um, just for us this week. As you know, this week's summit will be full of ways to get your team supercharged. So if you want to see what we've got on the docket for the rest of the week, visit the Agenda tab at the top of this events page to see our full schedule of events. Here's our agenda for this session. I'll go over some housekeeping notes. Uh, the speakers will introduce themselves and then we'll dive into our content um, and then we'll have some time for some live Q&A and then we'll wrap up with some key takeaways. But before we dive into the content, let's go over some quick housekeeping notes. First of all, this event is being recorded. You'll be able to access the recording um, and the key takeaways on our summit event page um, on the MSP website following the event. Second, if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function on the right side of your screen so we can get them answered live. Also, this chat is wide open, so please interact with each other. We really want to encourage uh, crowd participation. And now, without any further ado, I'm super excited and honored to introduce the next group because as Beyonce says, who runs the world? Girls. So let's get started now um, with the one and only Cassie Yetru. She'll be our moderator for this afternoon's panel. Cassie, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Roxy. Love it. Love a Beyonce reference to kick us off. I am Cassie Yetru and I'm the general manager of WISE. WISE is a global community building the next generation of female sales leaders, and we basically empower individuals and companies to have the knowledge and network that they need to be happy and successful in sales. So we do a lot of virtual events also, and I'm really excited to be here as your moderator today for MSP instead of on a WISE event, but really excited to get into things today. Holly, do you want to go next? Sure. Thanks, Cassie. Hi, everyone. Holly Proctor. Uh, I'm in the Bay Area, and I am the Global Head of Sales for Clary. Uh, looking forward to jumping into the discussion today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Marissa. Hey, all. Nice to meet you. I'm Marissa, a senior manager at Figma. Been here for about two years and really excited for this discussion. I'll pass it to Sarah. Hi, everybody. So like the title says, Sarah Bacon, Vice President of Marketing at Captivate IQ, and just very honored to have been invited to participate in today and uh, really looking forward to our chat with my fellow ladies. <laughs> um, also, I have a dog on the ground right now that is chewing on a bone. So if you hear that at any point, I apologize. But we have a lot to get into today, so we can kind of dive in. But Looks like we've also got some people saying hello, which is amazing. Um, so keep doing that, as Roxy said, and, and we'll interact as much as we can with you as well. Getting into things. So we'll, we'll get into the meat and potatoes in a second here. But before that, we'd love to have each of you just give some context on what your experience is to date and why you are also qualified to talk, talk about today's topic and be on this panel. So Sarah, we will start with you. You are, as you said, in marketing. But you said that your first exposure to sales was really as an intern building target account lists in the, the pre-Zoom info days, which I'm sure was interesting. Um, tell us about that and how it kind of led to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, like you said, Cassie, I uh, got my start, my start in my marketing career as an intern um, building target account lists for the sales team way, way, way before Zoom info days using mighty Google search and uh, the raw power of my brain and cleverness and ways that I could figure out how to triangulate and find the various websites for prospects that we thought might be a really good fit for our product. 
and uh, definitely an inter definitely very interesting job uh, working in the marketing team, but partnering very closely with the sales director. And this was also before ABM. And it's it's funny to me. I, I sometimes think of ABM as like this great rebranding of something that we as marketers have probably been doing our entire careers, um, creating these target account lists where you understand your prospect, you understand your buyer, you understand their needs and their pains and the profile of what they look like. And then you partner with sales on programs. So I, I thought it was a really great introduction to the marketing profession at large, partnering with sales, building empathy for sales and supporting that team. And I, I think there ain't no shame in list building. And I think it's great for everybody to have an opportunity to do that. Um, and so for me, that was just a great foray into my profession and where everything started. Yeah. I mean, that's ABM before it was yes. ABM. That's we did direct mail with that list and everything <laughs> all by hand. Oh my God. I remember I then later grew to have like an army of interns and I'm visualizing the conference room where we had it all spread out. So it was pretty cool. Right. Cause I'm sure there was a lot more paper involved than it would be now. <laughs> many boxes, <laughs> many boxes. <laughs> Love that. Thank you for sharing. Holly kind of piggybacking off of that. You've, You've worked for a lot of big names in tech, LinkedIn, we work. you've gone through several big transitions, so to speak. And particularly you left WeWork during what I'm sure you can agree was a tough time for the company at that point. Um, what did those transitions teach you? And do you think that you are better at your job because you've gone through those transitions and, and learned from them as you've gone? Sure. Um, you must be watching the active Apple TV documentary right now, which I'm, I'm, uh, oct I am, I am frequently asked about how real that is. So, uh, yes, uh, I was at WeWork prior to joining Clary. So I lead the, the sales team at Clary and, um, was at LinkedIn six years for six years before that. Um, both really transformational experiences. I started my career in consulting, spent four years as an AE before I jumped over to LinkedIn and really got into tech. And so, um, LinkedIn is one of the best places in the world to teach you how to lead, uh, especially lead compassionately. And so I often say that I learned how to lead in peacetime at LinkedIn, and then I learned how to lead in wartime at WeWork, and both are enormously valuable for different reasons. Um, there is, you know, not all um, business stories are hockey stick growth from up and to the right. Um, and so to be able to be battle tested in a world where, um, you know, there's really fierce expectations, where there's real consequences to bad decision making, um, and to be able to recover and still lead a team through that is a foundational experience I'm grateful for. Um, and no question, um, you know, feel more equipped to lead in times of change based on that experience. And so you know, hugely valuable to me. Um, I think it's something we should all sort of, you know, figure out as, as we balance the, the career choices that we make, you know, how do we make sure that we have exposure to different experiences um, and, and going through, you know, both the highs and the lows are what makes us better leaders. Um, and so no question, you know, hugely beneficial to me. Um, and so, yes, lots of good stories to tell, most of which probably better served over a cocktail um, from, from times that we work and incredible, uh, you know, experiences at LinkedIn too. So happy to share more on both. So I, I think we have to ask now, have you watched the special? Of course, of course I watched. <laughs> um, yes. Um, and I will say it's um, it's not just made for Hollywood. There's a lot of truth in those. So, um, so yes, it's been very interesting to follow along. There you go. Validated by a former employee that went through it. That's good to know. Um, and I think we can we can get into some of the, the nuances because I think hearing from you that you were a leader at LinkedIn during those peace times and then went to WeWork. I'm sure you have perspective on having done the former first and then going into that situation at WeWork. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, one of the things I appreciate most about um, LinkedIn's culture, and I don't know how many of you have exposure to LinkedIn's culture, it's very strong, permeates through the entire org, not just the sales team, um, but they're very intentional. And so they're very clear on, on what it looks like to be a part of you know, LinkedIn's team. And um, that's something, of course, that was that was missing at WeWork. It wasn't intentional. Um, and so that means that the culture transformed based on the things that were happening uh, at the time. And there wasn't this rock that could guide them through difficult times, which is you know not true. Of, of what LinkedIn built, for example. So um, it's a good lesson for all of us that culture actually helps you weather the storm. You know, if you have a set of foundations that guides your decision making, it guides your hiring practice, you know, it guides the way that you evaluate tough calls, um, you know, it can really support and be a, a weapon in times of change. Yeah, I like that, using it as a weapon and having strong culture. We'll touch on more of that later, everyone, in terms of playbooks for success, some of those cultural elements, but that's great. 
Marissa, you have been in sales from, from the beginning of your career. What keeps you continuously challenged and feeling excited about sales? Yeah, I... I love sales. I think sales is such a fun profession where you get to be really close to the product, which makes you so close to your company and their mission and their vision. And then I also like the human element of sales where you really have to know yourself. You really have to know your customer. You can ask good questions. You can stay curious. And for me, I've recently gotten into stoicism and I saw this great article about stoicism with sales. And that's a new challenge for me of how do you stay balanced through so much turbulence? There's so many peaks and valleys in sales. You miss a quarter, you hit a quarter. And like, how do you navigate those with a little bit of balance and controlling what you can control? And so for me, that just makes it so fun. And sales is ever changing. The environment is changing. Our customers' demands are changing. There's so much great literature around this, how this space is evolving. And so for me, that just keeps it really exciting because you can keep learning, you can keep growing, and you know, you can always stretch yourself. Yeah. And you also talked about having sponsors internally and externally that have helped you feel that way and you've been able to bounce things off of them. I think Holly is one of your mentors right now. Yes. Um, yeah. So has that been impactful as well? Yeah. I think that having mentorship inside and outside your company is so critical. And what's so great about the, the female leadership community in sales, it's becoming bigger and bigger. And Holly is someone who I met a couple of years ago and has made a big impact in my life. And I think the more we can reach out to people and support one another and just get insights that are a bit more objective than who you're sharing the halls with in your company, I think is really meaningful because sometimes you get so caught up in the details of your day to day. It's really important to zoom out and see the bigger picture and realize like, there are such good things in front of you and having some perspective from a mentor who's been there before, goes a long way. Yeah. Very well said. And we will talk more about mentorship and, and pro professional development in a bit, but um, in terms of leadership specifically, right? So obviously all of you are in leadership positions right now, and we could probably spend another hour talking about the differences between leadership and management, but that is not our topic for today. So in terms of what got each of you into leadership in sales, Sarah, for you, a sales related field in marketing, um, what has that journey looked like? Holly, we'll start with you. You kind of touched on it, obviously, a little bit already. But what was that initial pivot into leadership like for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I worked or I was about to work for a woman named Melissa Merwin, who's an incredible leader. And um, I distinctly remember this conversation. So I was an enterprise seller at the time. And I loved like Marissa referenced, I loved being in sales. To this day, if I wasn't a sales leader, I would go be a strat rep somewhere and just sell big deals. And um, I remember the conversation with her, which was a really friendly one, which says, I feel the need to sort of try on being a leader. Um but I am not convinced I'm going to be good at it. And so in the event that I'm not, can I have a safe path back? And so we sort of pre-negotiated what it would look like if I, if it didn't work either on my end or hers um, and, and said like, you know, I love the function so much. I, I, I wasn't quite sure when to hang out my bag. Um, you know, I was having a lot of success as a seller. And so it felt like a, a, a risk that I wasn't totally sure of. And so, um, and there's a little bit of you as a leader, I, I knew I wanted to try it on, but you know, there's always upside in sales. You can always see the next account or the next deal or the next thing. And so when to actually pull the trigger you know, to transition is a tough one. And so I was so grateful for the openness of that conversation to be able to say, um, you know, if, if it's not the right call, that there's, there's an alternative. So we designed sort of a really safe entry point into becoming a leader uh, where I took over a team and um, there, I just quickly learned that I got so much more satisfaction out of watching somebody that I coached win than I ever felt taking down a win on my own. And so, you know, it was just like, there was so much more joy and seeing somebody that I believed in do something phenomenal and, you know, being able to watch them soar. And that just really filled me. Um, and so it was, it was clear that, uh, you know, I, I was, I was going to stay in leadership. And then that only continued as you, as I took on, you know, greater leadership roles and started leading second and third line teams where there were just more people to watch thrive. Um, and then I felt this great responsibility to help service their careers, you know, in a way that, um, you know, could, could help them grow. And so, you know, part of that is, you know, coaching, uh, not just around the day-to-day -day job, but 
how do you get intimately involved in their career path and, you know, navigate barriers for them, you know, help them think about um, the path ahead and the job after the job. And it becomes this really fun intellectual exercise that's also very rewarding. Um, and so, again, grateful to, to my time at LinkedIn to help frame, uh, you know, how to take on being an early leader. The other thing that I think we don't talk about enough is how hard it is to take over a team if you're on it, right? And so my first team, I've only done that twice in my career where I took over a team that I was a member of. Um, and it's difficult um, where you're, you know, you're trying to establish yourself as credible. You're trying to move from, in that case, rep to leader. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's something that creates great opportunity, but is difficult to navigate. And so uh, great learning lessons all around um, and, you know, learned a lot from being able to sort of ease into leadership in that way. But I love that you're even being honest right now in terms of saying you weren't sure right out the bat and said, if this isn't for me, I want to make sure I can get back to what I know and love, which was being an IC and a top performer. But it sounds like the upside as a manager and a leader has been a lot more fulfilling for you. Than, than those individual wins. That's tough, right? Because we have now in a position where I'm, I'm putting people in leadership roles regularly. Um, it is very natural to look at your top performers as the bench for future leaders, right? And in sales in particular, the best player is not always the right coach, right? And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of scenarios where that goes awry, where actually, you know, the person that hits their number, right, they can demonstrate that they know the craft and are successful at the craft, um, but isn't always like the top number one rep on the board, um, you know, that's not the criteria to be a good leader, right? Uh, and, and so there's a lot of other things that you have to evaluate. Um, and so, you know, sales can be de deceiving in that way. I mean, I think that comes up so much, right, of it's not always just taking your top player and putting them in the coach's position. Sometimes that transition is hard for them to relinquish control or maybe they don't want to be in that position. So I think if someone figures out what the silver bullet answer for that is, we would all be better off. But I think it's a definitely an art more than a science. But we do have, I'll share, I do have a, a little bit of a litmus test on this one that has worked, which Amazing. is... Uh, not that it's a silver bullet, but it, it has like really helped um, over the years. So um, in considering internal promotions, this is only for internal, not external, but um, in, in considering internal promotions, I look at three things. So uh, the first is, is it clear and obvious? Um, so like, uh, and a secondary question to that is, would anybody be surprised? So if I were to announce tomorrow, you know, Cassie is the new leader of North America, would anybody be surprised? Or is the reaction like, of course she is, like she's the no brainer. And not that it's a democracy, but you don't want your, you know, the body to reject the organ. And if that person is already doing all of the things that is sort of required to be successful in the role, um, then naturally what you get is applause from the field. And so now you have a lot of people that are really happy to see this internal person move into a bigger scope. And so, you know, the would anybody be surprised commentary is a really good language. It's also great service to your team. Like if, would anybody be surprised? And if there's some self-reflection that says like, probably, uh, you know, it's a good conversation to have when people raise their hands for getting promoted. And then the other one is, um, are they already operating at that level? Are they already doing all the things you would expect from a leader in that role, which make the gap, you know, so much smaller uh, in practice and, and very easy to transition them into the role? That's great. I saw Sarah, you were, you were laughing at the organ rejection comment. What are, what are your thoughts on all of that? In your oh, I just, I, I loved, I loved listening to Holly and it was, I, I learned, I learned a lot actually just from listening to that response. And so, I mean, even being part of a panel, you can learn something. Um, and it just made me really reflect on a lot of similarities and just leadership in general and some of the sort of like endemic qualities, regardless of profession or what that looks like, but also some differences in, uh, leadership requirements for sales professions and just me getting a lot more like respect and appreciation for that and listening to that response. But yeah, this idea of the, the body rejecting the organ, I don't know, it just made me laugh and it makes me think about, you know, teams do, do need to accept like the leaders who lead them and the importance of that. And so that's not to be overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. Has your experience being in a, in a marketing leadership position are there any blatant similarities or differences that you were thinking about just hearing even what Holly just said? Yeah, I mean, thinking about what Holly was saying and kind of thinking back to my reflections on this over the last few days, um, I do think that uh, leadership um, has like there's a number of qualities that are similar in leaders, like regardless of the profession and regardless of like even at work and even outside of work. I think like those characteristics of 
you know, having your own vision and having that drive to see that vision come to life and working working with other people to bring that to life is absolutely like a key element and like having that, having that like je ne sais quoi feeling. Um, but I think as well, like that, that pure feeling of seeing something that's much bigger than you succeed and working with a team, um, individuals and leaders to bring that to life, I think is like my greatest joy and why I absolutely love my job. And, you know, my individual accomplishments, cool, like good job, Sarah. But at the end of the day, it's the team's accomplishments and the accomplishments that we um, achieve together, like through hard work and through like the, the grit and the grime um, and the ups and the downs that that's the stuff that um, really keeps me coming back for more. So uh, that that joy of leading together and seeing other people succeed. So I was reflecting on that it makes my heart very warm. Just to yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. You just repeated it a couple of times, but you and Holly both used the word joy in terms of talking about mm -hmm. feeling yeah. empowered and gratified and fulfilled just by seeing those around you find success and, and how that brings you joy more than your own success. So. Yeah, it's truly, it's truly an honor um, and joy to be able to partner with so many great people, like on my team at Captive IQ and on teams that I've worked with in the past to help individuals identify their potential, a path to realizing that potential, maybe helping them to remove blockers and just working together on achieving those types of goals. It's just, it's just really, um, it is a pleasure and a joy. Yeah. Marissa, you were in enterprise sales at Dropbox and then transitioned into management elsewhere. How did you know you were ready to be a leader or did you know? Yeah, I, I don't think you ever are fully ready. I think it was something I knew I wanted to do for some of the reasons Holly was saying. And I, I didn't know if I would like it. I loved being the IC that got the recognition and closed the big deals and had your name on the, the, the slide that said, like, this is the top performer. And when I became a manager, it happened because I, I was basically field promoted. There was an opportunity to start leading. And so I was in this player coach role where I was it was both leading and selling, which I think is very common for people in a small company or maybe large too. And I remember the first time someone on my team closed a deal and it wasn't my name on the like email that went out that said this deal closed. I remember thinking, I don't know if I like this. And as time went on, I really started, really started enjoying it. And it's coming to life really clearly for me at Figma. There's a really, really special team that we're building on the enterprise side and really more broadly across sales. And I remember being in the office, we're starting to be in this hybrid environment where people are going into the office again. And we had everyone get together at the end of the quarter last year, last quarter. And I remember being in a room with one of my AEs and we look outside the wall, like the glass, the glass wall. And he said, how cool is it for you to see your teammates hugging for the first time and everyone sharing ideas and people like really enjoying one another as company? And I remember thinking that is the biggest pleasure for me to see is how how awesome to see a group of sellers collaborate together and support one another in a field that you're usually like on your own and running your own race, which is so important to do. But it's so important to also lift each other up and learn in real time and make sure we're winning together. And to see that happen on my team, like that to me is such a privilege. And then to see my team get promoted into new roles and not just on the revenue side and what they're doing, but how they're doing it. And I have teammates who have really grown a lot personally in supporting one another, reflecting on how they give feedback, knowing what to say in the big room versus what to say in a one-off setting. And to me, seeing that personal and professional growth is is the most moving thing. And we had a QBR session yesterday and we had a woman on the team come to tears because she feels seen by this team. And to me, like there's nothing more moving than that. And so I don't I would say I didn't know in the beginning, but it is so rewarding to be in this position now. And it's also something you continue to get better at. And you have to do so much work on yourself because you have to show up for your team. And the only way you can do that is if you work on yourself. And so I just feel like there's an endless room for growth and improvement and iteration. And it's just it's it's like it's the perfect place to be for me. And it's it's evolved into that for me. 
Yeah. I mean, you can tell even just based on how you're talking about it, but you know, it's one thing to hire the right people for the role and who can be successful, but to hire people and to build that culture. I mean, to what Holly mentioned in the beginning, that good culture is a weapon that is even harder to do of firing the right people that also have a culture and have that camaraderie, especially doing it remotely. So I'm sure that was incredibly empowering for you to see. Um, Sarah, you mentioned something about how there's really no moment when you say, okay, I'm ready to be a leader. I'm all set now. Put me in the position, right? Um, but also that you don't have to necessarily be born with that leadership mentality that you can cultivate it. Tell us a little bit more about that. I think yeah. Really yeah. I mean, this is, this is something that's just like strikes on a major value of mine and a major belief. Yeah, I don't think that there's like a switch, you know, like, Oh, I'm ready to be a leader. I'm a leader today. Um, and I, again, like, I don't think that you're born with it either. Um, I think that it's a talent or a skill or a behavior or mindset that can be cultivated over time. Um, I think that it's an orientation to doing something that's like bigger than yourself. I spoke about that a moment ago, um, to maybe even like humbling yourself, like among a group of people and helping to like raise other people up, um, having a, having a vision and like the desire and the drive to see that come to life. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, those, uh, yeah, it's funny. I was, um, sorry, just like reflecting on this. I was speaking about with my husband last night too, um, another kind of aspect that I think is really important as well. And I, I know we're not going to speak about the difference between leadership and management, but, um, I do think it's important for people to realize that leadership does not have to be synonymous with having direct reports mm -hmm. and that you can really become a leader and demonstrate your skill for leadership and ability and potential through leading a project, leading a team initiative, leading a cross-functional or cross-departmental initiative within your company. And, kind of practicing communication, practicing caring about the group, practicing being organized and managing stakeholders, like all those behaviors that you'll need to do as a, as a leader with, you know, the title, the vice president or whatever title that goes along with that and the team that goes along with that too. Something that I also think is really important also when you think about like, okay, I want to be a leader. What does that mean? What does that look like? There's a lot of places that you can practice that where, you know, the stakes are maybe a little bit lower. Um, your job not on the line and you can look for outside of work opportunities to practice leadership. And I really encourage folks to look at nonprofit volunteer opportunities, especially like board of director opportunities with smaller organizations where you can really practice, um, you know, guiding an organization, leading an organization, leading a membership base, kind of managing all the various like stakeholders needs and requirements and leading through adversity, leading through success, all those sorts of things where you're not going to lose your job and you get that opportunity though to practice leading a group of people. So I was fortunate to have an experience like that in my life for a few years. And I really credit that experience to propelling me to um, executive leadership roles um, where I'm at in my career now. So really grateful for that. And I think, um, you know, don't just look within yourself at your organization, look at other places around your life too. And really like there's opportunities to lead all around us, leadership within your family, among your friends. Um, it's just kind of that, that like gnawing urgency and that feeling inside of you, like I gotta do this. I wanna help other people. I wanna lead this thing. So. Yeah, which is, I mean, I think that's a great reminder because mm -hmm. obviously a lot of people that are in our industry are very career focused and professionally mm -hmm. driven. But to your point, that mm -hmm. leadership slash management doesn't have to always start with your job mm -hmm. you know, in other places. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit late for us now if we've got like full time jobs. But I mean, even as a kid, you know, there's opportunities like youth organizations and taking leadership positions there. There's clubs. There's there's stuff like that as an adult. Also, you can you can find those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. OK, let's talk playbooks for success. We're about halfway through. So reminder to the audience to throw in questions into that Q&A section and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. But Marissa, you talked a lot about leading with compassion, having transparency, and really just treating the people that you work with as human beings first, um, as elements that have really been critical to your success. Why are those important and how do you instill those in the culture and teams that you build? I heard a quote, my sister's 
an engineer, a female engineer, so similar like woman in sales, woman in engineering. And she was talking to her team about this and she was saying, people behave the way you treat them. And I think that's just so real. And so you like, to me, it just is a no question. You treat your team with respect, transparency and, and accountability. And it's your job to set them up for success and, and lead them in a way that's individualized for their strengths and then, and supporting their weaknesses. And so to me, it's just, it's how you have to do it. And I'm a big fan of Bill Walsh, score takes care of itself. And that you do the right things, you do the right inputs, control what's in your control, and you'll see the right outcomes. And for me, that's a big way I lead. And it was a big part of how we handled last quarter at Figma. I came into the quarter and I didn't think we'd hit our number. And I told, I told my boss, he's like, you're going to get there. And I, I remember thinking I could come really hard on my team and start micromanaging and doing things in, in unusual ways, like different for me. And I thought, you know what? I have a great team and the score is going to take care of itself. And we ended at 153% of our number. And it just, to me, it was a moment of the score really does take care of itself. And as a leader, you have to hold the team accountable. You have to control the inputs. And it, it isn't to be it isn't to be soft, but it's to be treat them like adults and with compassion and empathy. And in and in a big part of last quarter too was digging into my team's why. Why are they at Figma? Why are they in sales? As things get hard, what is your why? And that helped us get through really hard times. And I had one person on my team come into the quarter thinking he'd miss, and he ended at almost 400% of his number. And we wow. anchored on his why. And it just, all this stuff, you have to do the right things, but if you do that, you'll see the right outcomes. And so it's just a big part. It was a big learning last quarter of this is the right thing to do. And I'm just going to keep getting better at it, but it, it really did work for us last quarter. Tell us a little bit more about the finding your why for those who aren't as familiar. How, how it came to life for us is Figma right now is such a special company in hyper growth. We are looking to double the size of the whole company this year. And through that, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of change. It's hard. Like your accounts get smaller. You're doubling the size of the team. And, and so it's really important to understand why are you here? And so we, we put together, I partnered with my HR business partner, who's incredible. And we put together an exercise of understanding your peaks and valleys so what are the moments in your life that were peaks for you? What are the moments that were valleys? Identify trends across those two areas. Think about the things that make you like create the most joy for you. And then, and then think about why are you doing the things you're doing? And then how can we, how can we couple your day to day with what brings you most value? Like what you're looking for out of your life and work is a big part of that. And I think a lot of people find purpose in their work and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, for them. And it's an, an individual's choice. But it so that was a big part of it for us is why are you here? What gets you excited? Analyze your peaks and valleys, see what that tells you. And through those exercises that we were able to see for a lot of my teammates, why are they here? And so when things get hard, helping you see the forest through the trees. And that's, it sounds like that's the zoomed out of what is your why? What is your North Star? having having that as the forest and not getting too bogged down with the details. I mean, I think everyone is experiencing burnout and work-life balance choice issues and, and things going on right now. So that why to have as that guiding light is so important, probably now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for some people, it's they want to be a CEO. For some people, it's they want to see a company scale. And so it helps in those moments that are tough. You have an account taken away, you lose a deal, you need those things because sales is really hard. And some of these things you you sometimes just don't win. And so it's how do you keep how do you keep going? Yeah, absolutely. Holly, you talked about investing deeply as a huge part of your playbook for success. What does that mean? Um Marissa, just need to double down on this. Sometimes you just don't win. And that's part of it. Um, so good call. I totally agree. Um, 
Investing deeply for me, um, it means a couple of things. Um, my bar for talent is super high and, um, and it's by design. And um, I think for me, it takes so much energy to uh, be a leader. It takes so much energy to invest in someone um, that you want to make sure that you're and you only have so many hours in the day. Um, and so, you know, you're trying to deploy those hours to its highest and best use. And so that means if I can invest in someone like Marissa versus a B player, you're going to choose that bet every time, right? Because it's a good use of your time and it's high ROI activity. And so, um, you know, the, the deeply thing means you give up your time. I think authenticity is really huge to the investment that I make. You know, how do you sort of bring somebody into your life and so that it feels like they have all access, um, right? And that you can be really open and create an open space so that it's like anything is fair game. Uh, the deeply part means like anything is fair game, whether that is like, you know, life work or anything in between. It's like, they're all the things that we take into uh, our work every day that impact our psyche, that impact our performance, that impact our point of view, right? And so, um, you know, creating an, a really open, authentic space where people feel like, um, you know, they can bring everything going on in their world um, and, and to be really open about the challenges they face. Um, and so that's sort of my first stab and first take at um, what I think it means. It also means that you probably have to do fewer, larger relationships. So um, you can't say yes to everything, period. And I, so I would rather have, you know, some consistency in a relationship where we meet regularly, we go deeper, um, you know, the, there's more impact from, let's say, either that relationship or whether it be a direct report or somebody else than like, um, you know, more infrequent and higher volume touch points. Um, there's just less return on those, in my opinion. Yeah. We, um, we talked about this on a wise event recently, but you can do anything, but not everything and really prioritizing, okay, what conversations, what relationships, which parts of my life and my job do I need to spend the most time on? Because you can't do all of it. Sarah, you have been at large companies, small companies. You've, you've done a lot over the size of your career so far. What has been consistent for you in your playbook for success and happiness? Oh, um, I think, uh, some of the things that have been consistent for me have been some of my just like fundamental characteristics and things that maybe, um, I've just had my life or have cultivated within myself. And I think some things that immediately come to mind are around like having a natural curiosity and there's definitely a dark side to curiosity. Uh, you gotta learn when to like cut that thing off and just like move forward. Um, but having a natural curiosity about people, about projects, about how things work, about why things are working or why they're not working, um, following like those tendrils and avenues of inquiry have led to some really interesting discoveries that have helped to propel my career forward. And so I think just truly like having that curiosity and that interest, um, has been, has been paramount for me. Um, I've also really tried to hone within myself this, um, this idea of like being courageous and being comfortable with failure and being comfortable with moving forward uh, despite ambiguity and knowing that some things will fail and moving forward in spite of that. And Marissa, what you were sharing earlier about, you know, beginning a quarter and thinking that you're going to come in low and then like, oh my God, you come in at 100%, 150%. Someone else comes in at 400. Like that's crazy. I think a lot of people would have just tapped out. And not like been willing to be vulnerable and be willing to fail. And I think you have to have that in order to experience success. Otherwise, you know, you might lead kind of a, a, a flat life and have a flat career. So putting yourself out there despite like risk of failure, because I think often we'll find that um, that risk of failure is just like our fears and isn't necessarily even real. And maybe it's just like, Oh, this is what I need to, once you get started, you're like, oh, this is really easy, actually. This is what I need to do. This is what my path is. Um, I've also really relished doing hard things. I like having big goals. I like being ambitious. I just enjoy doing difficult things. <laughs> I value challenges. I get very bored when I'm not challenged. Um, again, that has a dark side too, because I just, you know, sometimes I'm filling up my plate. But, um, you know, I've 
kind of pushing forward, uh, move, moving things, moving things along once I've mastered it, training others to then master it in my footsteps um, so that I can then go learn to do new things that are hard for me at the time. Um, those are some, so yeah, like curiosity, this willingness to be vulnerable and to fail and this idea of um, always like seeking to do the hard thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but Glennon Doyle. I know. Mm-hmm. Yes, we can do hard things. There yes, we can. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but Marissa, that makes me think too that your team probably felt so supported by you that they knew they would be okay, even if they didn't hit their number, that that stress of not hitting it allowed them to crush and hit 400% for that one, that one rep. So that not being afraid to fail and creating that open space for that, I think is, is so important. Okay. We are, time is flying by, but let's talk a little bit just about mentorship, creating culture of excellence, kind of building off of some of these things we've been talking about. But Holly, radical candor is is something you have really imparted a lot of um, just belief in, in terms of a, a cultural foundational element. Um, how do you hire people who have radical candor and can you train it? And also, can you share what it is with the audience for anyone who's unfamiliar? But how do you hire folks that have it? And then can you train it if they don't organically? Yeah, sure. Happy to talk about Radical Candor. Um, it's probably one of the best leadership books I've ever read. Um, and so would highly recommend it. Um, and it's, it's far beyond just leadership. It's just, uh, you know, sort of uh, how do you be, in my opinion, you know, a good, honest, transparent human being. Um, and um, it stems from the concept that there's actually a lot of productivity in difficult conversations. And so the world generally hates, con- hates conflict. Um, nobody loves conflict. It's awkward. It can be painful. Um, rarely do people navigate conflict well. And so um, mostly the general human nature is to skirt conflict. You know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you avoid, um, how do you sugarcoat? Um, and especially this is, this is often true of women, um, where, you know, there's a lot of sugarcoating and there's a desire to be liked. And so if the desire to be liked is strong, um, and you're in a position where you need to deliver either difficult feedback or conduct a difficult conversation, um, there can be this bias to, uh, hide the key points of the difficult conversation amongst um, a a flurry of fluff. Um, And so it's really hard to take out of that what the real narrative is. And so uh, Radical Candor suggests, of course, doing the exact opposite, which is in the spirit of really deeply caring about the person that you're giving this feedback to, um, that you tell them exactly, you know, the, the challenge that you're facing, the impact of that challenge, and give them the difficult feedback. Um, that by skirting the issue with, you know, a lot of fluff, that you're actually, you know, doing them harm, um, and that, you know, they now have um, an incomplete picture of their performance. They are often surprised because you, uh, you know, skirted the feedback, and um, and so, you know, you're you're being a bad leader, a friend, whatever to them, because uh, you're hiding the truth. So um, the while it's really challenging, uh, I think we can all point to conversations in our life, whether that's personal or professional, where, you know, you knew that something was building, um, you entered into a difficult conversation with fear, uh, you had like all the feels, right, like your stomach felt that way. It was like, you were nervous, you were sweaty. It was like all the things that suggested it wasn't going to go well and it was going to it was going to feel not fun. Um, and then you somehow empowered through the conversation and maybe even escalated, you know, maybe even got like into a point that you were uncomfortable with. But ultimately, you moved through the conflict. Right. And and for the most productive relationships, um, you know, the conflict actually served as a forcing function to improve the relationship. Right. You were able to, you know, get this thing that both parties probably felt uncomfortable with. Um, You know, you you were able to move through it and create resolution. And so um, it's a thing that I've used as part of, you know, I would say my my strongest professional connections um, have weathered some form of conflict. Right. Where, you know, you've been able to say we disagree on X, Y or Z. Uh, there's good merit for the disagreement and you can weather the conflict, you know, with respect, but with extreme transparency. And so um, I think 
I would go as far as to say that um, as a leader that cares about your people, assuming that you all care about your people, you actually owe it to them to give them radical candor um, and that you are, are doing a disservice to them by preventing them from knowing the truth. Um, and so I'll, I'll give like a couple examples. One is, um, you know, you're doing a talent calibration and, you know, the talent calibration happens at the senior leaders of the company and you're reviewing your team and, you know, your person is in the lower left, right? And so like the general org doesn't view them as your, as a successor to you. They don't view them as somebody that's up and coming in the org, as somebody that has high upside, right? And so there's this sort of view of where they stand. Um, when you have a conversation with them about their career path, um, right, are you being transparent that their likelihood of promotability is low within the org when they ask what's next for them, right? That their ceiling is likely capped, or do you help, or, or, or do you sort of linger on hope for them that they could be your backfill at some point? Um, and most people, because it's not a pressing need, right? Most people would just avoid the confrontation. And the good, strong, sort of radical candor leader would say, um, you know, there's no pressing, um, <clears throat> there's no pressing like endemic that would suggest that, you know, you're not, um, you're not continuing to do good things in your current role, but your upside here is capped, right? I don't see you fulfilled. Or I don't see you fulfilling a, a role beyond your current capability because of X, Y, and Z. Right. And um, that's a difficult conversation to have, but one that I think uh, brings a lot of truth to it and is fair. Yeah, that was incredible. That's a tough scenario. But to your point, I mean, I think I would rather you would rather avoid that conversation. Right. No one wants to have that conversation, but there's so much more benefit that can be had from having it. And as a leader, you also are learning from having it. Yeah, for sure. No question. All right. We are going to go through a couple more questions. Looks like we've got one in the Q&A. So throw in anything else that you've got and we'll make sure we get to that one. But um, moving right along, Sarah, you we talk a lot, right? I think on LinkedIn, in communities internally about professional development and the value that it has. Do you think that it's really important for leaders and companies to encourage their employees to develop their own network and brand inside and outside of the company? Or is that onus just on the employee? Oh yeah, I think that's a that's a really great question. And actually, I just want to um, just to comment briefly, like Holly, what you were saying about radical candor and owing it to the employee. Um, I think there's no way that person's going to get out of that lower left box if we're not honest with them either. And so, like that, you know, maybe their upside is capped at the organization, but we have to be we have to be honest to help people get out of that. Um, so anyway, yeah, Cassie, um, absolutely. I think that you know, letting the onus be on the employee, I think that people may not be at the stage of their career where they realize the value of networks and the value of community. And I think it's really easy just to like say that out loud. And it's an easy thing to agree with, like, sure, net having a network is valuable. But until you actually experience the benefits of leveraging your network and then supporting your own network as well, I think that's when like the magic starts to come to life and things start to click. And at least that, that's been my own personal experience with network. And so I've been able to really benefit um, at Captivate IQ from introductions that I've been able to get from my fellow execs and from others across the company to expand my own network. And I've returned that benefit in turn. And in the meantime, I have been able to support my own team and individuals with intros from my network and encouraging them like with other ways to find intros and just to get that cross pollination and to get you know, talking with peers in the space and especially with COVID and working from home, we've realized like, oh, we don't have to go to in-person events in order to meet folks. Like we can just open up our LinkedIn Rolodexes and, you know, fire off an in-mail. And often people are excited to make that connection because they're then growing their own. Um, I, you know, fast way to learn, like attending a panel today, also fast way to learn is having a 30 minute conversation with a peer in your space. Like you could read a blog post or you could just talk to somebody who's been doing it for the last 10 years. So I do find it's a really big shortcut. It is absolutely something I did not take advantage of in my earlier career. Because if you talk about doing hard things, I think figuring it out on your own and like inventing the wheel on your own is definitely a hard thing to do that I would not recommend. Um, and so, yeah, I think we as leaders, as part of professional development, owe it to our teams to teach them the value of having a network and really showing them how. I think a lot of people may be shy to reach out or may think that 
you know, it's asking, um, asking too much of somebody, but I think like the greatest gift that you can give to someone is demonstrating that you value their experience and expertise and would like to learn from that. And so I think, you know, not, not everyone's like willing to have a conversation. I know we have busy calendars, but it can also be a gift to uh, be acknowledged as, um, you know, a future potential mentor. So yeah, I think it's really valuable and we can teach our teams how to use that better. Yeah, absolutely. And really quickly, I think, Marissa, you mentioned this earlier, but there's value in getting an objective opinion outside of the four walls, whether they be physical or virtual, just to ground how you might be feeling for someone to say, nope, you're actually completely fine. That's a very normal thing that you're going through right now. Or to say, actually, that does sound a little strange. Let's work through that and figure that out. Because if you're just talking internally to your colleagues, they're probably experiencing, you know, experiencing something similar. Yeah, I, I know we mentioned it, but I Holly's been a mentor to me for the past couple years, and I met her through an old manager of mine. And it's just been the most wonderful experience. And I've brought things to Holly, and she tells me if it's good or not good. And I came to her with something that I thought was a really big deal, and Holly gave me radical candor. And she said, this, this argument doesn't scale up. And it was just this eye-opening moment that I really needed to hear that particular piece of feedback for this particular problem. And it's just so valuable to have that. And so if you get the chance to have someone like Holly in your life, it's, you know, a big blessing. And it's made a big difference for me as I have experienced my career at Figma specifically. Yeah. And to Sarah's point, starting those relationships earlier and being able to build on them as you go through your career. That is a perfect place, I think, for us to pivot into Q&A. Um, Marissa, we'll start with you. So this is from Nirvana. And the question is, what advice do you have for a female AE who wants to be in a management position and has asked for it, but seems to be hitting a broken rung, asking for a friend? <laughs> you know, it's tough without knowing the specifics. One, I think it's great that you're thinking about management and putting yourself out there. And from my own experience, I have gone four roles internally and I didn't get it. And I think there's a lot of learnings to be had when you, one, I think it's amazing to go for roles. And someone told me if you interview, if you get every role you interview for, you're not trying enough. And so there's a lot of value in this failure that Sarah talked about. And so without knowing the specifics and happy to chat offline is I think it's great. You're putting yourself out there. I think it's totally okay if you don't get the role. And then I think it's very fair to ask for specifics from your leadership team on what are, why, what have you missed and how can you create a path to develop those skills to be eligible in the future? I think all those things are really fair. And then leaning on a network like MSP for the learnings and, and networking to see what kind of conversations you can have to develop the skills that you might not be that you might not have today. Yeah, that's great. I think unless Sarah or Holly, anything to add there, otherwise we'll go to the next one. Well said, Marissa. This next one and our last one. So if anyone has anything else, this is your, your last call to throw it in. But this question is from Linda. So Holly and Sarah, I'll let you jump in on this one. How can we attract more women to SaaS sales roles? Obviously that's a big question, but initial thoughts. Sarah, okay, I'll, I'll give it a good go. Um, in general, I think um, one of the best ways to do it is to start at the bottom, which is, you know, how do we get more women into um, SDR positions? And then SDR positions flow into AE and AM positions, and then those flow into leadership positions. And so, you know, the best way to sort of protect the future is to start with, um, you know, the present at the very bottom of the funnel. And so I think um, the, that's number one, is how do we really promote in the SDR ranks, uh, you know, women in, in uh, SDR roles. Um, and then two, I think we have to create an appetite for openness beyond just, uh, you know, SaaS as a background. Um, and so, for example, when we're interviewing today, um, the experience that somebody has and what they're selling into is less important to me than the core characteristics of how they've sold. And so, um, for example, hustle is something that's very important to me. And um, that uh, is a drive that you cannot teach and that is just innate to somebody. Um, and 
whether you sold software or cars or something altogether different, um, you have a hustle that fuels you and, and drives you. And, um, and so I think there's an appetite and an openness to explore beyond just traditional roles that we, we should uh, consider, especially, you know, in our emerging or selling ranks. I mean, and as I'm sure you all know, the number of women that are in sales roles as of now decreases as you get into more leadership levels because, you know, people are choosing families or flexibility or whatever that looks like. And they're switching into marketing or customer success or what have you. Um, but to your point, it's, it's starting it at the bottom and continuing that support. But Sarah, anything to add there? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've obviously never hired anybody in a sales position. So as far as like the sales profession and challenges of hiring females there, I'm less familiar with that. Just some things that immediately come to mind to me, maybe, you know, talking about, talking about the culture of the organization and talking about, you know, the values of the sales organization and showing it's not a bro culture, that it's a culture focused on excellence and winning and hustle certainly, but, you know, definitely not like a bro boiler room type of situation, I think could help women feel safe in that profession if they don't already. So again, just like speculation and advice. And I think moments like this where you're highlighting women leaders in sales positions and demystifying that and showing it's not a, you know, it may be currently a male dominated profession, but certainly there's like many, 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 many women currently thriving today. And here's how they did it and deconstructing it. So I think moments like what we're, what we're doing right now, um, organizations like WISE and opportunities like this and beyond for women to network with one another, probably a great way to start to tackle that. Yeah. It's, um, I think Roxy from MSP is going to jump in in a second here, but we've seen a lot that the more junior groups to what you mentioned earlier, Sarah, do not understand the value of professional development and networking. And I think doing more of that, which MSP is doing, WISE is doing, a lot of organizations are doing, will help people feel supported and empowered such that we will keep more women in leadership as, the, as they continue to grow. So. Hey, Roxy. Hello, everyone. That was such a joy to observe. Very inspiring. Um, Cassie, you did a wonderful job. And Sarah, Holly, Marissa, y'all are so amazing. Thank you. Um, well, that was awesome. Thanks again. Um, so many great insights that all kinds of people can take away from this, not just women in sales. Um, all kinds of people can learn from these lessons, especially the one about um, not being afraid to fail. I think that definitely holds a lot of people back from trying to even um, assess their goals. Um, so we're going to have some more amazing content coming your way tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll kick off the day with a panel about how to manage your org's SDR surge uh, with a playbook for scaling your sales development team. And if you haven't signed up for our next event, you may register at the link in the chat. My colleague will drop it momentarily. If you already signed up, check your calendar invite for your own personal link, and we'll see you there. The panelists and I are going to head backstage, and thanks again so much for joining and supporting us. Uh, we really appreciate y'all. Thanks again. <laughs>